So first off, this morning we have a, a several speakers um, that we're going to introduce all at once so they can just proceed right into their presentations. Our first presenter comes from the Directorate of Construction at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. And this is Danessa Quintero. Uh, she's been with OSHA a number of years. I think she started out in Miami or Puerto Rico, uh, one of those offices, has moved around a bit and now is at the national office. She focuses in on work zone safety at OSHA and is one of their experts. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about what's happening in the Directorate of Construction, new standards that are coming out, things that will affect us in our work. Following um, Danessa, we have two presenters from the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. Um, I suppose most of you are familiar with NIOSH. It was created in the same act that created OSHA. Only, of course, NIOSH has no authority as far as issuing regulations or citations or penalties. They are completely on the research um, side of occupational safety and health. Jennifer and, and Dave Fosbrook have, over the last and over a recent three-year period, spent literally one year on the side of a roadside um, doing research. So they know very well what it's like to be out there and work, and you'll hear in their presentation. Um, about some of their research results and what they recommend as far as practices to keep workers and motorists safe out there. So without further ado, we'll start with Danessa and OSHA. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going to be in trouble if I don't read this. Those of you who are interested in professional development hours, they are available. Um, so let me read this, which I'm supposed to read. Attendees of this session who intend to use the International Bridge Conference to satisfy continuing education requirements in New York State or other states that require attendance verification, they must sign in and out, and there's a sign-up sheet right out, just right as you go out the curtain here, um, to verify your attendance. Uh, do you have to, uh, if you fail to properly follow the procedure, you may not be entitled for verification of their attendance by... Um, this organization. So please see the clipboard at the front of the room. Uh, there's a room monitor that if you need help signing in and out, and that's how you need to get your professional development hours. Okay, this time real, Danessa. Thank you. For those of you uh, that were here uh, when Brad was speaking, OSHA is also breaking the ties from the past. Under this new administration, there's a lot of changes. We're moving uh, at 100 miles an hour. There's so many things that we really want to do, but the only way that you can eat an elephant is really one bite at a time. However, let me le give you an idea of what is going on. Today I'm going to be talking about the OSHA mission. I'm going to be talking about enforcement. I'm going to be talking about new regulations, compliance assistance. And something that is very, very important under this administration is workers' participation. Under this administration, it's really everything about the work workers, workers' safety, provide safety and helpful workplace to those employees, and that they be aware and know their rights, and that the employers follow their, their rules and the standards and, and basically follow their responsibility. Right now, as we speak right now, something that is still bother the agency is that today, 14 American workers are going to die today, at the end of the day, and that happened on a daily basis. There's an average of 14 workers dying here in America for things related to worker, uh, worker safety. Uh, and these fatalities are completely, completely unnecessary. And like on um, the previous presentation, Brad showed you statistics and information about the Bureau of, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics basically maintain that information about the fatalities. OSHA also maintained that information about the fatalities. But something that we had not been able to put our hands on is incidents and illness. That's something that the agency had not been able to put their hands on. And that's what is so important that all of you, or some of you that work for different government uh, agencies, help us to be able to send this message. How you, do, how you do that? Every time that you see an unsafe condition, just report it. Call it the, to the 1-800-321-OSHA. Let us know, and we can take it from there. Uh, referrals right now, we have been trying to work in conjunction with DOT, trying to minimize all these type of incidents that are uh, and, and situations and safe situations that are out there. So it's very, very important that all of you be aware. There have been some states, like I have been informed, that have 
that have sent the um, inspectors, uh, DOT inspectors, to be able to take the OSHA 10-hour course. That's the basic training uh, course that it provides you information about how to rec recognize hazards and how to provide feedback to those employees to, to, sh to show them and also to the employers uh, how to abate those problems. So each year, 4.6 million Americans are seriously injured on the job. Also, all this is preventable, and there are thousands more who become ill in later years from present occupational exposures. Um, as we speak right now, last week, two or three fatalities, like I mentioned, just related uh, to traffic incidents, and, and all those are preventable, completely preventable. OSHA mission, uh, for those of you that don't know the OSHA mission, it's really simple. It gets to the bottom to assure safe and healthful working condition for working men and women by authorizing enforcement on their standards developed. And later on during my, 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 uh, here my, my speech, I'm basically going to be talking about some of those standards that we're working at the, that we're working at the present time. There's something that every employer needs to be aware. The employer du duty is very simple. They need to provide a place of employment which are completely free of recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death. death. And in addition of that, they also need to follow the rules and the regulations. The rules and the regulations, something that we have to be clear. When I receive call to the office, some people ask, but which one, what, which one is the code of federal regulation that I have to follow? If you're in construction, it will be the 29 CFR 1926. However, it doesn't stop right there. Like Brad mentioned before, there's some other standards because of the general duty clause that every employer needs to follow. If there's standards or regulations that come from the NC, American National Safety Institute, National Electrical Code, the, the, fire, the NFPA, National Fire uh, Protection uh, uh, Regulation, all of those regulations are completely enforceable under a 5A1. So it doesn't stop right there on the 26. In addition of that, if you're on a state OSHA, almost half of the state in this nation are state OSHA, so like in California, the OSHA regulations go above and beyond our standards. What it will be really the right thing to do? OSHA set up just the bare minimum standards. So if you can go above and beyond that, those standards and there's some situations that you should, for example, we're going to be talking about confined space. Our confined space standard is so old that basically the industry, have, what they have been doing is, you know what, forget about this standard. I'm going to follow the general industry standard that give me like stronger guidance and practices that I can follow to protect my employees. Perfect. We completely applaud that. That's basically what a good employer should be doing, going above and beyond. And under the Secretary of Labor, under this administration, basically, she is very into good jobs for everybody. We talk about NIOSH, and uh, we are basically working at a full speed with NIOSH with things related to green jobs. Uh, green jobs now, basically, green jobs will not be good jobs until they are safe jobs. When, job, when we talk about green jobs, we talk about, we refer to wind turbines, geothermal, solar system, recycle, recycling of material, green roof. Employers who wish to, um, to, to work with green, uh, help with the green economy, they need to remember that you're not dealing with different um, hazards. You're dealing usually with the same hazards. Uh, we have identified in OSHA. Uh, now at the present time, we're developing a new web page related specific with green jobs. And some of the things that we have found is that most of the hazards for employees working on all these different type of uh, green jobs are more or less the same. If you're basically working with green roof, you're exposed to falls, falls 
through a skylight or fall, fall from the edge of the, of the building. If you're working with wind turbines, the same thing. Something that we need basically to work with, uh, uh, with those individuals that work with wind turbines, how about the rescue? How are we gonna rescue someone that is working at the height in the middle of nowhere? But there's no fire department, no fire rescue. So all these issues are basically right now on the table and we're working with that and we're evaluating them. Uh, green jobs, basically they will transform our, our economy. Recycling asphalt while doing road jobs is clearly a part of that transformation. Um, ACOSH, that is our advisory committee, the Construction Advice Safety and Health Committee for the Secretary, is already uh, a, establishing a work group and is working at full speed, providing feedbacks and best practices to the Secretary, so then she can share that information with the industry. The advisory committee has five members from the private sector and five members from the public sector, also people representing the states and representing the federal government. And there's one representative from, from NIOSH that is also participate there. And that's basically what we're doing at the present time. The OSHA offices also participate with EPA and also other chemical associations. Workers engage in work processes and development of green jobs. Workers and employers come together to assess and abate these hazards. We need the help and assistance from everybody to be able to identify those hazards, especially the ones that have not been identified, uh, especially for, from the agency. Enforcement. Enforcement now is completely different. Uh, it's, a more it's a stronger enforcement, and there's, like I mentioned before, a lot of employee involvement. Also, record keeping. Record keeping, uh, we ask every employer to maintain accurate record keeping, essential through OSHA record keeping oversight and enforcement, concern about the incentives uh, offered by employers that intimidate employees so that uh, they do not report, uh, every employee that is basically threatened by an employer basically have a right to go to the agency and file a complaint and report it to the agency, especially those employees that have been, that have get fired from the job for basically reporting in unsafe conditions. They have their rights. Accurate records are important tool for employers to find out where the gaps in the injury and, in, and, and, and illnesses prevention programs are. Uh, it's really important that employers fill this OSHA 300. Uh, it's a great tool. It will be able to identify, like I mentioned before, where are the gaps, where are your problems, and if you identify the problems, you will be able to put your hands on it and be able to correct them. So be more proactive. On the strong informant, uh, last year OSHA hired 100, approximately 100 new compliance officers. At, at the present time, we have an average of 1,100 compliance officers around the nation. This is just federal OSHA. And also federal OSHA conduct approximately 39,000 inspections in the year 2009. Uh, and state, the state basically, they run their own program, but let's say if it is more or less half and half, they might have the same amount of inspection. Very, very close. We return to the strong enforcement, and there is a solution on their way in Congress that will remediate many of this, and basically it's called the Protection American Workers Act. Under this act, basically, is we, we're trying to remove the old act to be able to be stronger and come uh, with, with better ammunition to basically try to deal with these employers that continually basically decide to not follow the standards and basically continue hurting people. Under this new act, they're going to be, the citations are going to be higher uh, right now. They're around $5,000, the citations are gonna be higher. Increasing criminal penalties and expand criminal liability for employers who knowing permit conditions that contribute to the death. And expanding workers' rights. We're gonna be expanding workers' rights. If you as an employer, you subcontract, something that every employer or the controlling employer need to know is that if something 
is found and unsafe condition is found and is related to one of your subcontractor, you as an employer can be as citable as that subcontractor. And that's called the multi-employer citation policy that it was created in 1999. On multi-employer work sites, more than one employer might be cited for hazardous conditions that violate OSHA standard. Um, how that basically happened? How can OSHA do that? Well, under that policy, who can be cited? The creating employer can be cited. Who's the creating employer? The employer that causes a hazardous condition that violates an OSHA standard. Also is the exposing employer, an employee whose own employees are exposed to the hazard. The correcting employer, an employee who is engaged in common undertaking on the same work site as the exposing employer and is responsible for correcting a hazard. And then at the end, the controlling employer, often the general contractor. So in just one, one incident or one unsafe condition that it might be identified, let's say it's a scaffold, whoever erects the scaffold can be cited. The person that is exposing the employees is also citable. The general contractor that is at the trailer doing the work around doing inspection is also citable. So three different companies can be cited for just empl employees for one particular company be exposed to the unsafe condition for those four different reasons. Compliance assistant. Um, OSHA has also been accused of abandoning the compliance assistant. What is really the compliance assistant? The compliance assistant is the program that is non-enforceable side of the agency. It's like a consultation service, the one that provides the support to every employer that doesn't have the tools because of lack of resources uh, to be able to identify how he can provide a safe and helpful workplace to those employees. So this compliance assistant program continue rolling. And every employee, for example, last, uh, last year we did approximately 30,000 work sites to different small employers and help them to increase and improve their safety and health program. So it's still out there. Worker participation, like I mentioned, crucial. Um, and what is going on really in the director of construction where I work? Cranes and standard. The anticipated publication of a final rule, we hope, please, that is July 2010. Existing rule is based in part of a consensus standard of almost 40 years old, so it's really about time. Uh, it's designed, the new standard is designed to address leading causes of fatality, such as electrocution. electrocution. Uh, collapse, over, overturn, crush and struck by hazard during assembling and disassembling. Um, basically, we're hoping that that standard come in just a few more days. Just, it's right there, next month. Um, the director of construction uh, basically is also working with the confined space standard. Proposed, the proposed standard went out in November of 2007 after significant involvement with the advisory committee and other stakeholders. The, hearing, the last hearing was held, held in 2008 and currently is under review comments and evaluation opinion in light of public input. Um, on the enforcement side, on the director of construction, the compliance directive of steel erection standard for construction has been modified for question 23 and question 25. Also, there's a technical amendment under the 754A steel erection standard and expects rescission on the residential fall protection directive that it had been causing a lot of confusion out there in the industry. And that's basically what is going on on the director of construction and in OSHA in general.